Hallelujah. Just before I get into the message for today, I want to share a quick story. Uh, about a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago, I had the bright idea that I was going to buy some plants. Now, those of you who have seen the two struggling plants we once had at the church understand that I have a brown thumb rather than a green thumb. But I wanted something to look at at my house, so I determined that I was going to go and buy some plants. I'm going to look for the ones that you cannot kill, and I'm going to put those plants in my house. So long story short, we went to the store, and at some point I had to face reality, and I realized that every plant I've ever had I have killed, so why am I going to waste my money? But I still want something to look at. I work at home. I live at home. I'm always there. I want something to look at. So I decided to buy some bird feeders. Got my little pole to stick outside the window so when I'm working, I can see the birds come and eat. So I bought a pole and the two bird feeders and filled them up with bird seed. And day one, no bird. Day two, we saw one bird. He went to the fence, went around the yard, went to a neighbor's bird feeder, but he would not come and visit me. Now, I didn't spend all this money on bird feeders. And bird seed, which, by the way, is not cheap. I did not realize that you actually have to pay for seeds. They're going to grow and fall on the ground anyway, right? <laughs> so I went and I buy this bird seed, and nothing is coming to eat this seed. Well, long story short, this morning I get up, I go downstairs, and I'm washing some dishes, and I look out the window, and there is a red belly robin at my bird feeder. And he is just pigging out. He is having a good time, and y'all, I got excited. I said, Chris, I got a bird. And he comes downstairs and he said, congratulations. <laughs> my son's been picking on me. My daughter's been laughing. My husband's been picking on me because I'm sitting there talking, no bird ain't coming to eat out my feeder. This is why I'm sharing this. Because on the way over, I was thinking about my bird feeder. And y'all, I've been proud. I've been grinning all morning because of that robin that came to visit my bird feeder. And God used even that to show me something. We have to understand that he has called and anointed us to feed this world. He's filled us with things that are valuable, things that are nutritious, things that people need in order to be, to be sustained, not only for this life, but for the life to come. Yet we get discouraged when they don't come and eat. And we take down our feeders. We decide this isn't worth it. People don't appreciate me. They're not going to show up anyway. This is costing all my money and my time. I give up. Yeah. And what the Lord showed me was, even though the feeders are out there, any bird who is looking for food, and this is wintertime, so food is scarce, any bird that's looking for food can come to that feeder and they can eat all they want. Nevertheless, there will only be one or two in some days where there will be none. Still, I've done my job. I put it out there, everything that they need in order to be sustained. And so I want to encourage you because everything that God has placed in you, I know what it's like sometimes to feel nobody wants this gift that God has given me. Nobody wants to hear these words that he's told me to say. Nobody cares about the actions that I've taken. And what God is saying is hold on and just stand. Let the wind blow and let the rain fall on you. Just stand. Eventually one will come and then they'll bring a friend and they'll bring a friend. But even if they don't, you still have what they need. And you ought to put a grin on your face because you're filled. The Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you is the answer to every question, every problem, every dilemma in this world. You stay full whether people come and eat or not. You stay full. One thing I noticed about those bird feeders on that little pole, that little pole started looking a little rickety. Me and my son were looking for a good place to stick it down in the ground and trying to get it straight so it wouldn't be on a hill. You know, yards are not quite flat. And so one day it rained. Another day the wind was, I mean, that wind was whipping. And I said, oh, I don't know, Jaron. I don't know if these bird feeders are going to stay or they're going to fall. Let's move them away from the house so if they do fall, they won't break the window. <laughs> so we repositioned the feeders and they still swaying in the wind. But then I realized they're not going to fall because they're full of seed. They're too heavy for the wind to blow over. If you stay full, you won't blow away either. Amen. Come on, and when people begin 
to partake of that which God has placed on the inside of you, you got to get refilled. Amen. When the bird feeders get low, you put more in there. If you don't, they will blow away. Not only will they blow away, but the day will come when a bird who is really starving comes and sits on that perch and there's nothing to sustain them. Mm. Come on. Be encouraged. Amen. Amen. Can we just give God some praise? Hallelujah. 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 I don't know about you, but that encouraged me. And speaking of bird seeds, we're going to talk a little bit today about the seed life. Yeah. Talk about the seed life. We're getting ready to enter into this fast, a corporate fast as one body. And during this fast, we're asking God to work on us. We can look out in the world and see that there's a whole lot of issues. Yeah. But right now, God, we need you to work on us so that we can be instrumental as you're working on others, as you're working on this world, as you're working on this government, this system. Just We need you to fix us first. We need discipline. We need the anointing. We need power and boldness. Come on, we need worship. We need a relationship with God that cannot be shaken. And that's where we are. And so we're going to start at the very beginning, at the point of a seed. I have in my little Ziploc bag here something for show and tell today. I'm going to pass these around. I have two little seeds for you to take a look at. Now, these two seeds are apple seeds. How do you know? Because I told you. (laughs) And unless you are an expert in seeds, you kind of have to take my word for it. Or you can choose to wait until those seeds are planted and you will see that they produce apples. Today, I'm going to ask you to just take my word for it. They're apple seeds. I ate a green apple this morning, Granny Smith, if you like. I cut that Granny Smith open and I pulled the seeds out and put them in the Ziploc bag so that you could take a look at these seeds. Now, those seeds don't look anything like a shiny green Granny Smith apple. They look small. They look insignificant. They look bruised and worn. They don't even have a solid color. They got pimples. (laughs) They are scarred. They're unattractive. If I dropped those seeds on the floor, nobody would even pay attention to them. You would not see their potential. Instead, you would throw them in the trash or just vacuum them up. Because they're seeds. And even though seeds have the potential to produce life, when they don't look like the life they're going to produce, they're trodden over. You, I, we have been called to live a seed life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're called to look like those little seeds in that Ziploc bag. We're insignificant on our own. But with the right environment, we have great potential. Amen? Let's go to John chapter 12. I'm reading out of New Living Translation this morning, although I prefer King Jimmy. Amen. (laughs) NLT, John chapter 12, and we will begin reading at verse 23. John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus is talking about the fact that it's time for him to die. And he's letting his disciples know that not only is this a death that I have to endure, but all of you who are my disciples, you will go through the same process. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls in the ground or is planted in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. It is always our prayer, God, use me. 
Lord, I want to go out and win souls for your kingdom. I want you to use me as a vessel. I want to disciple others. The reason that we are not reaping that harvest is because we refuse to be planted and we refuse to die. God cannot use you if you won't be planted and if you won't die. Even Jesus Christ, the son of God, accepted the fact that I must be planted. God is going to take me. My father is going to take me and put me in a casing of flesh and put me on the earth. And I'm going to have an appointed time, an appointed season, an appointed location, an appointed assignment. I'm going to be planted. And then I must die. Even though I have supernatural power, even though I can fight anybody who fights me, even though I can get off a cross when I'm dying, I must submit. I've got to die for the greater good, for the will of my father to be done. If Jesus did it, we've got to do it. We have to take up our cross. Amen? Amen. So we can't go out here and expect God to use us to build a kingdom when we refuse to be planted. We're not still. We don't want to sit anywhere. We don't want to listen to anybody. We can't be accountable. We won't be still. And then we won't die. We're still going to do whatever our flesh tells us to do. We're not going to submit. We're not going to give up our desire for his. You got to be planted and you got to die. I want to read to you a short article. This is from (laughs) ehow.com about the life of a seed. It says, when a seed is planted in the ground, germination happens. Germination is the process in which a seed changes from a state of dormancy or just being a seed to a growing living plant. A seed contains a tiny plant embryo as well as all of the nutrients an emerging plant needs to begin its growth cycle. In order for the plant embryo to become a plant, key environmental factors must be present when the seed is planted. Water is one of the most important factors in seed germination. Water causes the seed pod to swell and eventually burst, which allows water to reach the plant embryo. Water is essential for cellular respiration, the metabolic process that gives the seeding energy until it can emerge from the soil and get sunlight. Now, I'm going to pause there for a second. Because if you can see this in the spirit, you should have just got really excited, right? This is ehow.com. They have no idea. That God has created, created these seeds, and even in their explaining them, we can see all in the spirit on how we're supposed to work. Amen? Amen? The seed contains within itself a tiny embryo that has all the nutrients required to sustain life. You have on the inside of you everything that is needed. God created you in his image. So there are things that God possesses that you also possess. Now, some crazy people take it too far and they say that we're little gods. No, we're not little gods, but we are like him. And it is our desire to become more and more like him every single day. So you have some things on the inside of you. You have the ruach, the breath of life living on the inside of you. Everything that is necessary to produce life. And then on top of that. Ehow says that water is the most important factor in seed germination. Out of your belly flows rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you is what causes you to get full and burst so that what's on the inside of you can come out. Amen. (laughs) What's on the inside of you should swell up. And come out when the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. Let's keep on reading ehow.com. It says oxygen is also essential to cellular respiration. So it must be present in order for the seed to begin to grow under the soil. This is why it's important not to plant seeds too deep. If they can't get enough oxygen underground, I'm sorry, they didn't say can't, they said can't. (laughs) If they can't get enough oxygen underground, they may be unable to grow. Temperature is another important factor in seed germination. Though the ideal temperature for germination varies from plant to plant, most seeds need an environment that's between 60 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit in order to germinate. 
Once the seed pod bursts and cellular respiration begins, the tiny seedling gains the energy it needs to push up through the soil. The emerging plant will begin to grow plant tissue, forming the beginning of a stem. Most seedlings grow out of the seedling curled over like a person touching their toes. As the seedling gains more plant tissue and gains more stem, it breaks free from the soil. After this point, germination is complete and the seedling can begin photosynthesis in order to gain energy. This will cause the emerging seeding, seedling to straighten up into a tiny plant as it aims for the sun. <laughs> Praise God. The seed life. You've got to understand the potential that's on the inside of you. And then you've got to recognize the atmosphere that is conducive to your growth. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. You have to have an atmosphere where the Spirit of God is also present, not only in you, but around you. That is the oxygen. That is the breath of God, not only inside, but on the outside. You've got to be around other people that are breathing God, too. And as you get around other people that are breathing God, all these nutrients, the word is coming to life on the inside of you. Worship is building you up. Prayer is building you up. And before you know it, you're reaching, you're becoming more like the son himself. You're reaching toward him. You're grabbing toward him. You're chasing after him. I'm pressing for the mark of the prize of the high call. Have you ever seen a new plant, how it pops out of the soil and it's like it's pressing? You have to turn it around so it'll keep facing the sun. Otherwise, it'll start bending over because it has one vision. Even a plant has no eyes, but it has one vision. You're not going to get a plant off its course. It's going toward the sun. So see, when Jesus is over there, we ought to bend. And when he moves over there, we ought to bend that way. We're only chasing after one thing, and that is to be like him. The interesting thing about seeds is when they first start to grow, when you put a seed in the ground, the first thing that happens is the seed grows roots. Even the seed recognizes, I'm in good ground, so I need to plant myself here. And I need to extend myself so that I can get everything I need from every direction around me. Mm. You mean I'm in a place where I'm meeting some prophets? Let me grow some roots there. Because when I have trouble hearing from God, guess who I'm going to call on? So you're you're in my environment. You're in my good soil. That means that I'm supposed to be getting nurtured by you. You mean I'm planted in a place where I have access to teachers? And there's some things I don't understand? Let Let me put a root there. See, I'm going to hold on to you because when I don't understand something and I need it broken down, I'm going to pull on the nutrients that are on the inside of you so that I can grow. See, this is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. We can't expect to be a seed that's dropped anywhere with no roots and grow up to be a tree. That does not happen. And then we choose what kind of fruit we're going to produce. That does not happen. Where are your roots? The funny thing about a plant is if you pull it up out of the soil and you kill the roots, the plant dies. But even if the soil gets bad, let me help you. Those that feel like you were ruined by the last church or ruined by that crazy leader. See, when you pull a plant out of the ground, if you preserve the roots, all you got to do is stick them in some water and it'll grow again. Come on. Even Job talks about it. He said at the scent of water, it will live again. All you have to do is have access to the Holy Ghost and you will sprout again. Really, a plant cannot be killed. Do you know that a plant, if it's taken care of, can live a long time? If you peel off the pieces that are dead, it'll keep on living. See, some of us, we, we, we're dead in sin, but we won't peel that sin off. See, he said die to self, die to your flesh. Now that dead stuff called sin, you need to take that part off. And you'll continue to flourish. If that fornication issue keeps riding you, peel it off. If that alcohol issue keeps riding you, peel it off. You can still live. 
Don't let it kill you. Come on. Ah, man. <laughs> Once those roots take hold into that ground, the germination process begins and it continues to go until there's a plant that produces more fruit, which produces more, more seed. Number one, this is what God is saying to us as a church. Number one, we got to die to our flesh. When I took that seed out of the apple this morning, it didn't kick back. It didn't say, no, I'm happy here. I don't want to get in no dirt. I'm happy in this nice, sweet, fleshy, cool apple. It feels good in here. Don't you take me out. See, it, it didn't fuss. It realized that my whole purpose is to be removed from this place that's pretty. You know, a Granny Smith apple is pretty. And some of us, see, God has, has, has placed so much inside of us. We're a seed, but we, we like being in the atmosphere that's cute. We don't want to be, we don't want to be relocated to a place that's dirty and ugly. Even more, we don't want to be relocated to a place where we can't be seen. Well, we know how to get to a seed in an apple, but when it's in the dirt, it's real hard to find exactly where you planted that thing until it begins to grow. So we got to die to flesh. Then we need to learn how to be discipled. Oh my goodness. Y'all, uh, some folks in these new generations said, I love y'all young people. I do, but you got to learn how to be discipled. Just because you read a book and went to two classes does not mean that it's time for you to start a church. Just because somebody prayed over you and, and prophesied to you does not mean that you need to get on a plane and go preach in Zimbabwe. We need to learn how to be discipled. Don't let church kill you. Can I say that? Because church folks will set you up for the okie doke. Church will kill you if you don't know the word. God has more for you than that. He wants you to be discipled. You deserve for somebody to hold your hand and walk you through your salvation until you are strong enough to work it out on your own. You deserve that. And that is what God has ordained for each of us. We ought to be discipled. Somebody should be, the world calls it, mentored. We need mentoring. We're not meant to do all of this on our own. Yeah, there's some things between you and God that you got to work out. Absolutely. But you ought to have a spiritual coach, not a life coach. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so tired of all these life coaches. They can't do their own life right. Mm. Go take a little piece of class and pay somebody $99, and then they're going to charge you $200 an hour to coach your life. Mm. Stay away from these life coaches. It's a scam. Don't let anybody coach. How are you going to put your life in the hands of somebody that don't have their own life together? And then on top of the fact that they don't have their own life together, they didn't even get a four-year degree to coach yours. If you're going to do that, take the class yourself. I'll give you six nine nine nine. Be your own life coach and just call on God anyway. Amen? That's what it's going to come to. <laughs> we got to be discipled. Number three. We have to bear our own cross. Jesus said there, there would be suffering. There's going to be persecution. We got to take up our cross and bear it if we're going to follow him. That means there's going to be some issues. You got, there's some stuff that's going to challenge us, but there's nothing that can overtake us. When we have God on our side, there's no temptation taken to you, but such as is common to man. And with that temptation, God always offers a way out. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn it. Glory to God. Bear your cross. And then number four, you got to learn how to multiply yourself. We are disciples to be disciples. Fruit dies so that the seeds can be released so that they can produce more fruit. We're going to look at this in scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about multiplying. Amen. Amen. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through or around about 13, I believe. In Paul's letter to the church, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with one another. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of the world? After all, who is Apollo? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow or it was God who gave the increase. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters, they work together with the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers and are of God's field. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flame. First, Paul rebukes the people because he says you're still living worldly, you're still living crazy, and you're giving people credit for who you're supposed to be in Christ. And he says, listen, it's not important who lays the foundation. It's not important who plants the seed or who waters it. All you need to know is that God gives the growth. So what does that say to us as seeds who are trying to produce more seed? It says we need to stop giving people credit for what God is doing. And we need to stop chasing after people to do what only God can do in us. He goes on to say the most important thing is the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Make sure that anything that's built is built on a solid foundation. Your roots have to be in the right soil. And after that happens, he says different people build in different ways. Some use gold, some use wood, some might use iron, some might use straw. Different people are going to help us to grow. Different people are going to build us up and they're going to do it in different ways. We've got to stop expecting everybody to act the same way. And just because somebody doesn't step to me the way I think they should step to me does not mean they have nothing to teach me. I need to be able to learn. See, there are different materials in our homes. What if everything in your house was made of wood? You'd have some issues. See, wood expands when it gets wet. Do you really want your sink and your faucet made out of wood? What if everything in your house was made out of glass? It wouldn't last very long. And you're going to get hurt because glass doesn't work for everything. Just basically windows and sometimes some doors. But you don't want glass floors. You won't be able to wear your good shoes, ladies. Crack, crack. <laughs> like you're walking on ice. But see, why is it that in the body of Christ we say, well, you know, I'm just going to go and get mentored by a prophet. And I'm not going to listen to anybody else because God has called me to be a prophet. And, and that's the only voice I need in my life. The devil is a liar. Well, I can't receive from anybody who's not an evangelist because, you know, if you don't just have that heart for souls and, and you claim you hear from God, I just can't receive from you. Only evangelists can talk to me. You're going to have a problem. Or even more, you know, I just can't sit and listen to Caucasian preachers because they don't hoop and holler like black preachers do. 
oh, you're going to have some issues. Or, you know, I can't listen to black preachers because they don't understand the life that I live. See, we got to get over this stuff. God can't use a woman in my life. I'm a man. I'm the head of my household. But you ain't the head of hers. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I don't want nobody preaching to me who don't have what I have. Maybe they gave it up so they could preach to you. Yeah, see, see, we got all these prejudices in the back of our mind. I don't want to listen to anybody that don't speak good English. Let me tell you something. Some of the most profound leaders in my life were uneducated, broke, and did not speak good English. But they understood the voice of God. I got to get rid of these prejudices. What Paul is saying is, listen, there are going to be many that build upon you. The foundation is what is important. As long as that foundation is Jesus Christ and they don't try to change that, be careful what you shun. And remember, God is going to judge it all at the end of the day. And whatever is left standing, <laughs> that's him. Mm. Now, don't let people put stuff on you that's not God because that's going to get burnt up. But if it is God, I don't care what package it comes in. Look, my children this year, I said, what y'all want for your end of year gift? I didn't wrap nothing. Not a box, not no wrapping paper, not a bow, none of that. Do you think my kid said, I don't want it unless it's wrapped up in Santa paper? They don't care. See, when you get older, you don't care what it's wrapped in because you want the substance. <laughs> when you're mature, you don't care if they're preaching in jeans or if their skirt is down to their ankles because you're looking for God. We got folks now, they can't, ain't no woman going to preach to me if she don't have on a dress. Okay. You missed it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not listening to no man preach unless he has on a suit. You missed it. Or we do this one. I don't, I don't want you to pray for me to be healed when you got cancer. You missed it. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We got to start seeing in the spirit and stop judging by our eyes. Let's go on to the next scripture. Let's look at Luke chapter 8. Is this helping at all? Yeah. Praise God. It's helping me. Ooh, Luke chapter 8. Verse 4. We'll start there. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 8 and verse 4. One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as it had been planted. When he said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. And so he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I will use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil, they represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. The seed that you are to produce, the word of God, 
You have to understand that just because the plant doesn't grow doesn't mean the seed was bad. In every one of these cases, the seed is the word of God. You throw the seed out there and the seed that falls on those who are listening to the enemy, he's just going to snatch it away anyway. They're in the world. They're not going to understand spiritual things. Then there are words that you will share. There are good works that you will do. And they're going to hit some people who just have the wrong foundation. Can I tell you a secret? You can't convert everybody. Some of you have Muslims in your family. And you're telling them the word of God. And you're crying out to God, why won't you save them? Why won't you save them? Why won't you draw them? Why won't you draw them? Their foundation is jacked up. So when you speak to them, they're encouraged for a moment, but their foundation is in the wrong place. And it's not your job to dig up a foundation. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit. Remember we said if those roots are pulled up and they're placed in water, then they will live again. The Holy Spirit has got to get to them and only God can draw them. You can't do it. It doesn't mean the word is wrong. The word of God works. But it's got to come in contact with good soil. Then there are those who hear the word and they just caught up with the craziness of this life. See, just like God told us at the beginning, they haven't died to self. They know what God is saying, but they're too consumed with the way they live life now. They're too consumed with crime in the corporate ladder. They're too consumed with flying all over the world that they won't shut up and be still and do what God has called them to do. Stop blaming yourself for that. You are the bird feeder. I don't know where that bird went. It's none of my business. I provided the seed to get him where he needs to go. Amen? Amen. And even the seed that falls out the feeder. There's some birds that will come and eat that too. See, sometimes when you're talking to that one person in the break room and it seems like they're just not hearing you and they, they say they want God, but their actions say something different. See, you don't realize the person that was sitting at the table over in the corner who also heard the conversation. That seed fell on the ground and somebody caught that and you have no idea that you are feeding somebody else. Keep on talking. Come on, y'all, stop getting discouraged because you don't see the results. You plant, somebody else waters. God gives the increase. Just trust God. Stop worrying about what kind of ground everybody is. Just plant the seed. It's not our job to sit back and, I don't know if that's a good ground because he has tattoos and he got a ring in his nose. I don't know if I want to spend time ministering to him because that's a waste of time. That's not your problem. It's not your job to judge. You share what God has given you to share and trust him to give the increase. We are not soil experts. <laughs> Come on, y'all. There's nowhere in this word that says we prepare the soil. We're the seeds and we plant seeds. This is what our seeds should look like. Let's go to John chapter 15. Our last scripture for today. But I want to encourage you with this one. You got to be a seed so you can produce fruit and plant more seeds. Amen? Amen. And spiritually, we always carry the seed of the word of God. The word is a seed in and of itself, or dare I say, himself. <laughs> Jesus said he was a seed, right? And we're seeds just like him. He is the word. We plant Jesus. That's our job. John chapter 15. One of the very first scriptures I learned, I learned it in the King James, but I'm going to read it in NLT. (laughs) Jesus says in verse 16, John 15, 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. In King James, he says that we will produce fruit that remains. Fruit that remains, eternal fruit. 
what we are called to produce last into eternity, past this lifetime. We're not called to make people happy because happiness is temporary. We're not called to make people comfortable. Comfort is temporary. We're not called to make people rich. The prosperity gospel is not a gospel at all. It's a trap. It's a curse. It's not what we're called to do. We're called to plant fruit that produces or plant seed that produces fruit that lasts for an eternity. And because it lasts for an eternity, it also produces seed for an eternity. You are reaping residual income and don't even know it. You know, that's why people get into multi-marketing schemes and that kind of thing, because they feel like I'm always going to get paid. I sell once or I recruit once and I continue to get paid over and over and over again. Do you not understand that this is the best marketing and payment plan ever? You sow seeds. You give Christ. You give love. That's what he says. Love one another. You share the love of God and it lasts for generations and generations and it impacts people that you will never ever meet. You will never ever see. Influence. We talked about it in our mentoring session. Influence. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. Power for what? Power to be my witnesses. What does it mean? It means you will receive influence as my witnesses and you'll be able to go and preach in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the parts of the world. You have been given influence. Use it. You might not think you're anything, but God made you something. And he said, if you would just open your mouth, if you would just love on people, it is going to impact them. I don't care how small you think you are. That little apple seed is small It's ugly, it's insignificant, it has no voice, it has no money, but if I plant it, it will feed everybody in this room. Forget what they said to you, forget what they called you, you have in you the ability to feed them for eternity. Come on here. Y'all are. You know why rich people don't ask you how much stuff is? Because they got it. It doesn't matter. See, when I go in the candy store, let's, let's bring this down to my level. When I go in the candy store, I just get what I want and put it on the counter, on the counter because I know it can't cost but so much. I got that. Right? But see, if you multiply that by millions, when you go down there to the Maserati car dealership, notice they don't put tags on the cars like they do at the Honda dealership. You can't see, you can't walk by and see how much that car is. Because if you need to know how much it is, you can't afford it. I never see commercials for Maserati, for Lamborghini. (laughs) They don't need commercials because the people who can afford it know how to get there. Amen? See, people who are wealthy, they don't worry about what poor folks say because they know that you're going to need me before I need you. In the spirit realm, we got to understand how wealthy we are. You got to stop letting people tell you you crazy. You down there at that cult church and what's going on? Yo, what your faith going to do for you now? Stop letting that stuff move you because spiritually you are wealthy. Nothing is going to take you out of your comfort zone. Nothing is going to make you anxious because you know that everything you need, your God will supply it. So that's why, you see, it doesn't matter how many millions a person has. When cancer hits that house, their life falls apart. When cancer hits my house, no. I got this. Put it on the calendar. Put it on the countertop, rather. I got this. God is bigger than cancer. Some people lose their job and they want to put a bullet to their head. I've lost my job. It's fine. Put it on the counter. I might be upset for a little bit. I might have to dig a little deeper in my purse, but I got it. Come on here. Come on. You are the answer to this world. You are the seed that will feed millions for eternity. Open your mouth. Open your arms of love to your fellow man, to the person that you work with, to the person you get your hamburger from in the drive-thru. This is the seed life. This is where God has called us to be. 
And even as we get ready to go into this fast, my prayer is that God will do in us just as his word describes, just as we even saw on ehow.com. I want the Holy Spirit to fill us during this week until we bust open. And the world can't help but see, wait a minute, there's life in that one. I don't know what happened to Mauricio, but then something, something is busting out of her. Let me, I'm going to act like I don't like her. I'm going to act like she crazy. But see, I got an issue going on that nobody knows about. So when everybody else leaves, I'm going to Mauricio and I'm going to ask her to help me and pray for me. See, people know where their source is. Come on. I, I can be real with y'all. Maybe y'all never had this issue. See, I've, I've been in a position before where I was out and didn't have no money. I've been in a position before where you swipe the card and it said denied. But you know what? There's always another one. I don't have it there, but let me move some money from over here and let me, let me do some stuff over here. Come on, you know how we get resourceful. Y'all don't act like you always had positive accounts and everything. <laughs> you know how we get resourceful? <laughs> See, that's what the world does. The world realizes, especially now, there's so much going on politically and economically. Do you realize there are people around you and what they've always drawn from before is now empty and it's getting denied, it's no longer working for them? And they're saying, wait a minute, what else do I have deep down in my purse? What do I have in the back door that I can hold on? I know Pastor Alice. Now, last time I talked to her, I cussed her out. But my money ain't working for me this time. And I know when she was in this situation, she didn't lose her mind. So let me, let me go deep down in the bottom of my purse and, and pull out Pastor Alice and call her up and see if she can encourage me. See, we have to be ready for that. Because that's where the world is. See, five years ago, we would go out and do evangelism, and everybody would say, of course I've heard Jesus. Of course I've heard Jesus. Do you not understand? There are people you work with who have never heard the gospel. That's the time that we live in right now. The president issued this executive order. I was reading on CNN that just that quick, in a matter of less than two days, 130 million people risked not being able to get into this country from Muslim countries alone. That's a lot of people. Where is the church? Are you serious? 130 million. We can't even get 130 to come to a service. We can't even get 30. We're good at 13, praise God. (laughs) Amen? Use your influence. Live the seed life. Get planted and start producing some fruit that remains into eternity. Amen? Amen? Does this help anybody today? Y'all encouraged? Are you encouraged to grow so you can help somebody else grow? Praise God. Well, stand to your feet. Let's give him a high praise. Hallelujah.